Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining today. I'm Morgan Dunn, coordinator of the NextGen Business Partnership here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Through a collaboration with historically Black colleges and universities and other minority-serving institutions, we are working to develop the next generation of diverse business leaders and entrepreneurs. The Chamber's Equality of Opportunity Initiative is a bold, ambitious agenda that advances private and public sector solutions to help, to help close America's race-based opportunity gaps in education, employment, criminal justice, health, wealth, and entrepreneurship. Today, we pause to celebrate Black History Month and are thrilled that you have joined us for this event, Equality of Opportunity in Action, Black Innovation and Entrepreneurship, then and now. We will reflect on the rich history of innovation and entrepreneurship of African-Americans, which paved the way for many of the businesses we see today. And we will hear from businesses, leaders and entrepreneurs about the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. So let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Rick Wade, Senior Vice President for the Strategic Alliances and Outreach here at the Chamber. Thank you so much, Morgan. You know, since slaves landed in the British colony of Jamestown, Virginia, back in 1619, a spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship was prevalent in the African-American community. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, innovators and entrepreneurs were prolific and included the likes of Thomas Jennings, the first black patent recipient for a dry cleaning process. Louis Latimer, who invented a method for making carbon filaments for the electric incandescent lamp. Madam C.J. Walker, the first woman millionaire who revolutionized the hair care industry and countless others. You know, today, according to the United States Joint Economic Committee, more than 3 million Black-owned businesses contribute over $200 billion to our economy annually and employ about 1.2 million Americans. The reality is that the combination of innovation and entrepreneurship holds unlimited possibilities for African-Americans, for families and communities, to say nothing about the vast benefits to our country's overall economic well-being. During this conversation, we'll hear from two business pioneers about the history of Black-owned businesses in our country and the power of entrepreneurship. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Robert Bob Brown, Chairman and CEO of BN BNC Associates Incorporated, a management consulting, marketing research and public relations firm headquartered in High Point, North Carolina. And also Mr. Nicholas Perkins, Chairman and CEO of Perkins Management Services and Black Titan Investments Corporation, the parent company of Fuddruckers. Let's jump right in. Mr. Brown, let's let's level set and, and, and let's talk first about history. Uh, in, in your book uh, entitled, You Can't Go Wrong Doing Right, which I love that title, you talk about being a liaison between the business community and the civil rights movement of the 1960s. In fact, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a friend of yours. Tell us a bit more about that part of your life, particularly as related to the role of business in the civil rights movement. The business community and the civil rights movement were at odds uh, at the very beginning, uh, during the sit-ins and all of the things that happened, because nobody was ready for this revolution to take place. And uh, there were always daily conflicts between what was being done and and the movement that was taking place and the business community because the business community was totally unprepared because black people in this country had never reacted this way before and so they needed some guidance as what to do and where to go and how to do it and uh, that became uh, one of the things that i became very involved with during that period and Mr. Brown, was that was that role uh, primarily in North Carolina, but across America? It was everywhere in this country. It was north, south, east, and west. 
but it was more profound in the South because of segregation and how things were with Black people in the South. You know, Nicholas, um, uh, when you think about uh, where we've come from and where we are now, uh, but all success uh, measurement, you are a successful entrepreneur. Uh, you are, uh, you run Perkins Management Services and Black Titan Investment Corporation, the parent company of Flood Ruckers. Uh, tell us more uh, about uh, your journey. And, and I'm curious also how you would describe uh, the state of Black business in America, both challenges and opportunities uh, today here in 2023. Well, thank you. Um, you know, entrepreneurship for me has always been uh, what I consider uh, the uh, the gateway to uh, economic independence, for, especially for people of color. Uh, as an undergraduate student at Fayetteville State University, I uh, decided that I wanted to become an entrepreneur and establish Perkins Management Services a year and a half after graduating from Fayetteville State University with the goal of providing contract food service management uh, to historically black colleges and universities and, and really dove directly into a red ocean, if you will, out an already mature and established market that was dominated by multinational, multi-billion dollar corporations. So, you know, it was, uh, you know, for me, a very heavy lift. Uh, however, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be able to continue to persist and create it a niche market, you know, for, for myself and, uh, and allow Perkins management to continue to grow and thrive uh, in this space is somewhat of an anomaly as the uh, only 100 uh, percent minority independent contract food management company to exist. Uh, as we then, you know, transition through the pandemic, which was a, a, a hard reset for many of us in hospitality, uh, I was granted the opportunity to participate in the acquisition uh, process for Fuddruckers, World's Greatest Hamburgers, and was successful in acquiring that company. Uh, but it has uh, been, as I said earlier, very uh, heavy, heavy, heavy lift. Uh, as I think about, uh, you know, where uh, African-American entrepreneurship is in our country today, again, I believe that it is the way uh, for uh, people to bring about uh, so social, societal change, uh, and I understand how power response to wealth and, and the fastest way uh, to generate wealth in our country uh, is through uh, entrepreneurship. And I do believe that it is uh, the answer to that question. And so uh, there is a lot of work that I believe that needs to be done to create a more equitable uh, playing field for access to capital, access to contracts, access to opportunities for minorities in our country. I believe that discrimination costs, uh, it costs our nation. Um, it, it costs, uh, you know, every all parties involved. Uh, and uh, when you look at where our gross domestic product could be absent of discrimination, uh, it shows that, you know, the support of small women and minority owned businesses strengthens our nation's global economy. And I think that uh, we need to be focused in and around that. Yeah, and let me also say, uh, Nicola, congratulations. Uh, and we're saying this in 2023, but it's my understanding you're the first African American with 100% ownership of a national burger franchise. Yes, uh, we are still uh, uh, making first uh, here in 2023, but it marks the progress. But it still points to the challenges that remain. You talked about discrimination costs, and you know we have a partnership with the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, which says that if we address all of the inequalities in America, that America's economy grows by some $8 trillion. So there is a business and economic case for this work. Yes. Uh, Mr. Brown or Nicholas, you know, when we think about the 3 million Black-owned businesses across the United States, most are sole proprietors. They're one, two employees. What guidance or what would you advise as we think about growth strategies and, and what are some of the growth sectors that in emerging markets that we have to compete in if we're going to make an impact and, and truly uh, continue to help close the wealth gap? Any thoughts there on emerging markets and, and growth strategies and how a black owned business should be thinking about the future? Nicholas? Well, I believe that uh, we have to understand that we are ushering in a new economy, a green economy, and that there are a tremendous amount of opportunities uh, that exist in uh, the emerging 
uh, technologies, right? As we move to more to more environmentally, uh, you know, fundamental economy, the way that we do things our, as our world changes, the way that we eat, the way that we uh, move, how transportation is evolving. I think that there have there are a number of different uh, opportunities that exist in in energy, uh, in agriculture. Uh, in, in technology, uh, the markets that you have not historically seen many African American entrepreneurs participating in. I think that uh, as we uh, redefine and reimagine how our world works, uh, I would encourage uh, our entrepreneurs uh, of color to invest more time, energy, and resources in understanding how to partner with our government and finding those opportunity gaps that exist. Uh, in uh, uh, participation in a new and a way uh, world order, if you if you will. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, uh, Nichols, I would add to that. I mean, uh, international trade and exporting. Uh, Ninety five percent of the world's consumers live outside of our borders, and there is a tremendous growth of opportunities for Black and other minority-owned businesses to sell their products and services to those consumers who live around the world. The point I want to make there is that uh, for the first time uh, last year as well, the Minority Business Development Agency, which had always since its inception in the 1960s, uh, had existed by executive order. And we were real thrilled that the United States Chamber of Commerce uh, endorsed uh, legislation on Capitol Hill for the first time ever to codify the Minority Business Development Agency, making it a permanent part of our law, uh, elevating its role, more capacity, more funding, and for the first time ever, the appointment of an undersecretary for minority business in the United States of America, uh, Don Craven. So we're excited about the work of MBDA and moreover, that this has been a priority of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Nicholas, uh, let me bring you back in. Nicholas, you, you referenced something earlier, uh, uh, access to capital. And let's talk a minute about, I guess, the big elephant that is still in the room, if you will. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, the, the facts are clear that black owned businesses are less than half as likely to get financing as white owned firms. Sure. Uh, I was in a conversation re recently with Steve Case, the co-founder of uh, AOL and the CEO of Revolution, uh, who reminded me, and, and we know this, that uh, 1%, only 1% of venture capital goes to black founders and less than 2% uh, goes to Latin American founders. Would you agree that uh, the, the life or death issue facing black owned businesses and others is capital? And, and how do we bridge the existence of capital with access to capital? Yes, I, I do believe that uh, it is a, a persistent issue. I don't believe that there's anything new about it. Uh, I believe that the discussion uh, around access to capital for minority-owned businesses has been one that's been discussed year in and year out. Uh, I believe that there must be more intentionality uh, from uh, our, even our own government uh, to hold uh, financial institutions responsible for uh, the uh, lending practices of many of our nation's large financial institutions as it pertains to uh, propping up and financing and funding uh, businesses that are operated and owned by minorities. Uh, without that, uh, the minority business community growth is stunted, if you will. You know, uh, many of our businesses, uh, you know, don't even get off the ground uh, because we can't get access to the capital that we that we need. Uh, the majority of our companies, you know, are in the service business when you think about that. So, you know, many of the, of the people that I know struggle with having uh, opportunities to to obtain uh, loans uh, that they need for working capital, for, you know, just uh, for purchasing of goods and uh, supplies that they need for their businesses and, you know, and making payroll. And, uh, you know, that's a problem. Um, even even some that are government contractors that have a government contract in hand, you know, struggle with that access to capital. Uh, you know, and so I think that uh, it's very important that we uh, try a different uh, strategy as it pertains to, uh, you know, providing uh, true access to capital for minority owned businesses. And I would love to see, uh, you know, our government get involved. Uh, and leverage some of, of, of its agencies uh, to step up and uh, provide uh, 
uh, lending opportunities uh, to minority businesses, you know, through the SBA, uh, very similar to the way that that's able to be done uh, through the uh, United States Department of Agriculture. Yeah. Nicholas, you know, one of the things we learned during the pandemic, and I'm sure you were fully aware of the of the data, the Institute of Economic Research reported some 41% of black businesses closed. And during the time of government of PPP funding, one of the things that we learned that we certainly need to work on strengthening the relationships. Uh, I'm one who believes that, you know, you, people do business with people they know and we got to have relationships. Do you agree with that, that, that the building the ties, we found that a lot of black owned businesses that were small, for example, didn't have the banking relationships. Uh, necessary uh, to, to succeed and to how, how do we go about doing that uh, uh, strengthening those ties and and, and and the knowledge assets even uh, among black owned enterprises when we think about access to capital right well I think that there's a there's a gap there uh, I think the that that again you know our nation's large financial institutions need to be more intentional about getting into the community. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think is important is outreach, right? And uh, and and building trust uh, within uh, communities of color is vitally important. Uh, I think that uh, it was a, a lesson learned by many small and minority-owned businesses, the importance of, of, of having a relationship, having an advocate internal in the banks that could help to focus on your business uh, and help to, you know, get your application in and things of that nature. I mean, it was vital for us you know, uh, as a small business, uh, because we had a relationship with the Harbor Bank of Maryland and Joe Haskins and the team there that was thinking about us as this legislation went through and was helping us to make sure that, you know, we got our applications through working day in and day out. And we see often, you know, our, our CDFIs and uh, minority-owned community banks doing more of this, right? But, you know, there's a greater bandwidth that exists uh, through a non-minority owned banks that if they had that same intentionality uh, that they could have, you know, as great of an impact, if not a greater impact in communities of color because of their vast resources. So I think that it really needs to be, uh, you know, more uh, more intentionality on their part to get involved in our communities, because we see that when they when they are uh, invested, the things that they're able to do is just unfortunate that that, that those success stories uh, are not necessarily attached to minority-owned businesses. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. You, you know, we, we, we're talking sort of uh, uh, Black-owned business innovation entrepreneurship then and now as we observe Black History Month. I mean, the reality is, unlike uh, in the early 1900s, uh, technology and digitization um, uh, sort of changed the way that we live, work, and certainly do business. Do business. Do you believe that uh, Black-owned businesses and enterprises are keeping pace uh, with the rapidly changing technology, it's almost you know, either your tech company or tech enable. Uh, but but how are we doing with regards to embracing and keeping up with the pace of technology? Well, you know, in order to be able to do that, uh, those uh, investments and, and overhead investments cost. Um, you know, we we recognize that in order to operate your business efficiently. Uh, in order uh, for you to be able to have access to data in real time, uh, you know, the power of technology goes without question, right? But, you know, the, that technology is expensive. And in order to make those, those investments, you know, into your company, um, you know, you've got to have the uh, financial uh, ability to be able to make those investments, right? And so, you know, when, when minority companies or com companies in communities of color do not have access, you know, to the financial resources that they need, how can they keep up, right? And so, you know, it's a domino effect, right? And so uh, many people that I know, you know, still, you know, operating on Excel spreadsheets, you know, some antiquated methods in order to be able to, you know, continue to operate their business that they've stood the test of time, but have not necessarily been able to make the type of investment uh, in technology because, you know, it's not that they haven't, uh, have a, a proven product or service, uh, but, uh, the, you know, they're still uh, having uh, a challenge in, in access to the capital they need to be able to make the necessary investments that they would like to in those type of technological advancements. So it's, it really is a domino effect. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was thinking uh, in, in preparation for this, uh, historically, 
uh, I'm not sure that everybody understands that uh, black owned businesses are more than just job creators. That's right. Uh, they're more than just innovators, but they are extremely important anchors in the what I call the social fabric of our communities. When I grew up in a rural textile town in Lancaster, South Carolina, and we know you are not from Lancaster if you say Lancaster, by the way. <laughs> but in Lancaster, um, uh, Nicholas, there was a uh, an area that we affectionately called the Hill. It was sort of our black business district uh, uh, where there were the black doctors and lawyers and there was a fresh seafood market. There was even a what we call the knickknack cafe. I guess it would have been our version of Starbucks. Right. Yes. But the hill also was where the community gathered socially. And and I imagine uh, to some extent been reminiscent of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, uh, which I'm headed there shortly. But I'm curious that your, 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 your thinking on. What, rather, what can we learn from, from that part of our history? Can, and can we recreate those business uh, enclaves and ecosystems today? And when, wasn't that a really important part of, of, of our communities, uh, that coming together uh, and, and the community of Black businesses? Can we recreate that? I believe so, but I believe that it, that it must be intentional. Uh, I believe that there is power in group economics. I think the one thing that we could learn uh, from Tulsa is that, uh, you know, racism and discrimination, uh, you know, has, you know, been, uh, you know, in the fabric of America's DNA, uh, you know, for over 400 years. But we also see that, you know, it, it, it was, you know, anytime you saw economic independence and people of color, it was always met with violence. Well, you know, me as a student of the movement, I wanted to understand, especially very early on, you know, why, you know, was it, you know, that that level of, you know, uh, you know, we were by segregation laws excluded from, you know, uh, public accommodations and things of that nature in terms of of integrating into white society. So whenever you saw these pockets of econ of of, of this economic uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems began to sprout up. Um, you know, they would burn them to the ground, right? And because I learned early on that there is power uh, in wealth and uh, where you you find wealth and you find power and and not only just uh, political power, but also economic power. And so, you know, it seemed as if uh, communities of color were not supposed to organize and galvanize in, in, that, in those ways. And so, you know, historically, you know, we have, not done that uh, as we see in other communities like, uh, you know, in the Jewish community, like in uh, the Asian communities and others, you know, that that seems to escape uh, African-Americans. And, and I believe that uh, that there that that in lies a part of the problem. I believe that if we work more collaboratively together, uh, if we uh, uh, spent our money together, if we invested together, uh, and, and, and pool our resources together, we could deal with a lot of the problems that continue to persist in our own community rather than looking from without uh, our own community to have a positive impact there. So I think there's a lot that can be learned uh, from, from Tulsa. Yeah, and you know, and, and it's not just as individual communities. This is, must be a collective effort, uh, Absolutely. Uh, not just companies and corporations and the U.S. Chamber, but also policymakers. It's a, it must be a, a whole of country uh, effort to inspire innovation and entrepreneurship. Because I mentioned earlier, it's not just good for black communities, it's good for all of America. Uh, in fact, following the murder of George Floyd, as you know, a number of companies uh, across the country stood up and, and made public commitments to help close race-based gaps in our country. Uh, we at the Chamber launched this historic, ambitious equality of opportunity initiative designed to do just that. And we're making great strides. Uh, particularly in areas of uh, you know, getting more companies uh, to do business with minority firms uh, it's through supply diversity, uh, diversity on corporate boards, uh, and making the business case of why this work matters, not just for uh, uh, companies, but good for our economy. Let me end with a couple of final softball questions, and I want to thank you again for joining us. But uh, one of the initiatives that we started many years ago, uh, the Next Gen Business Partnership, with historically black colleges and universities you referenced and other minority serving institutions is really about developing the next generation of business leaders. Uh, and my question is, what's that one, just one, because I know there's many, but that one bit of advice 
that you would give to a young aspiring entrepreneur who simply wants to be like Nick? What's that one piece of advice? Uh, dream beyond the resources that you currently control. Uh, start from where you are with what you have and uh, d don't allow any of your present circumstances, uh, be they uh, less than ideal, prevent you from going after your dreams and goals of becoming an entrepreneur. And then this is the final question. With all of the hard work and sacrifice that you made in building your enterprises and sustaining them today, what do you do for fun? What do you do for Nicholas Perkins on an off day, which I imagine they're not too many of? <laughs> what do you do? What do you do for fun, and and, and where do you find joy? Well, I got to tell you that uh, that that question kind of somewhat stumped me because uh, I don't uh, uh, really get very many uh, days off. I think even on my days off, I'm constantly uh, uh, reading and trying to find ways that uh, my uh, enterprises can 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 help to assist and bring about social change. But I think the things that provide me, you know, of course, the most joy uh, is uh, African American art. I'm a, I'm a African American art enthusiast. I collect African American art and constantly, uh, you know, looking, you know, to evolve. That I love to cook. So uh, anytime I have the opportunity to be able to get in the kitchen and and do that and be able to cook for people, I I try to take full advantage of of, of doing that also. And then mentoring. You know, I, I try to invest uh, as much of my time as possible uh, with uh, young people and focusing in and around the next generation of entrepreneurs. Well, listen, again, thank you and thank Mr. Bob Brown for joining us. Thank you for all that you do uh, to advance equality of opportunity uh, in the United States of America for your sacrifice, your hard work as innovators and entrepreneurs. Thank you for helping to create and grow businesses to build a more inclusive economy and ensure that our country is truly a place where every person has a fair chance to simply pursue and live out their own American dream. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I'm Megan Trzenski, Senior Director of Strategic Alliances and Outreach at the U.S. Chamber. Black-owned businesses have a significant impact on the U.S. economy, and yet they face obstacles like limited access to contracts, funding, and mentorship networks. The Equality of Opportunity Initiative is dedicated to closing race-based opportunity gaps and accelerating the growth of Black and other minority-owned businesses. Today, I'm joined by amazing entrepreneurs who will share with us their paths to entrepreneurship, and what the future might look like for Black innovators. We have with us Dr. Modi Aborio, CEO of Health Botics Limited, Lisette Laverne, CEO and founder of Lisette Laverne Law, and Sean Roberts, founder of CSR Consulting. Please, let's welcome our panelists today. Hello. So I want to get started, and uh, Sean, I'll pitch this first question to you. What inspired you to start your own business, and what's the biggest lesson you've learned? Yeah, thank you for that question. So my biggest inspiration for starting my business was simply um, my desire and love for just helping people. Um, started with as simple as that, and um, I always just enjoyed the feeling I got from providing value to somebody. So I kind of took that and, and saw an opportunity to start a business or do something where I can provide a service that can be helpful to somebody. And that service for me was building websites and, and helping with um, digital marketing. The biggest lesson um, I learned through business was to continuously provide value to your clients. Um, I found that, you know, once you develop a, a strategy or you're doing something for them, things get old real fast and technology continues to emerge. So there's always something new that clients could um, be doing or you can be doing to help. And I found that the best, the biggest lesson that always provide value or else your clients will find it elsewhere. That's a great lesson. And Lisette, you started out with one of the oldest and largest law firms in the US and then you pivoted to start your own firm. Can you tell us about that? Yes, um, working at a large law firm was quite an advantage I had in terms of being able to pivot and launch my own business because I learned a lot about processes and systems 
and how you know law firms actually work and there was mentorship so there was a, a very solid foundation so by the time i started my own business i had a lot of tools um and i think that you know learning from your past experiences um really can help you build that solid foundation that you need um, and all of it, even directly, direct or indirect, even work that I did as an intern before I even got to the old, one of the oldest and largest law firms was really valuable because ultimately it's about your skill set and it's about building those skills. That's really what's going to help you as my, um, you know, panelists also said, Sean, that um, adding value to a work product, adding value to the services that you provide. Thank you for that. And we just heard, you know, from Nicholas Perkins that obviously access to capital mentorship, it's very difficult. And so I'm curious to know uh, where you two have been able to find resources. Lisette, if you want to give us your answer first. Well, the very first place I found resources, and they're probably on listening right now, was family. Um, definitely access your, you know, if you can, your family for resources. But beyond that, I just am a researcher, right? I'm trained to research. And so really researching for, you know, guidance, small business administration, guidance, grants, um, yeah, all of that. Sean, what about you? Um, so for me, I'm currently a Gen Z. So my Gen Zers might be able to relate, but my biggest resource has been YouTube. Um, I, I can literally find anything on YouTube if I'm curious about a business or I want to learn something new. I always start with YouTube. Um, I find that helpful for me because I'd rather watch a video and somebody else explain it rather than read a bunch of boring documentation sometimes. So YouTube has been one of my biggest resources for sure. You know what, as a, as a homeowner, I can also say that YouTube is a great resource. Um, but I just want to talk about some of the challenges that maybe you have overcome in sort of growing your businesses. We know that 2020 was a very difficult year in particular for black owned businesses. And so wondering what you can tell the audience about how you've accelerated your own growth and the obstacles that you've overcome. Um, for me, um, Lisette uh, kind of mentioned it, um, talked about systems. My biggest uh, obstacle I faced was I never took the time whenever I first started to implement and really think about having systems. So for a while, I was kind of just doing things um, just off the cuff and working with clients here and there, but I never really had systems in place. So I can never really grow my business or take it to the next level because I didn't have a system for um, sending invoices or just doing that kind of uh, maintenance tasks or operational tasks that every business has to do or go through. So um, that was my biggest obstacle I face, not having systems and not being able to um, grow. I think for me, one of the biggest obstacles um, or challenges, I would say, was spreading myself out too thin, was having wearing so many hats, especially when you launch. Um, it, it, there's actually a really positive side to that, but when you are actually doing it, I was like human resources manager. I was, you know, also I had to I had a radio program and I was an attorney. I was doing a lot of different things, um, you know, having to manage the finances as well. And when you, going back a bit to the previous question, when you mentioned resources, I was thinking about financial resources. When I mentioned family and, you know, different ways that you can access resources, but resources come in many different ways. And so having a great mentor that's, you know, a successful seasoned entrepreneur, that has been helpful in my field. And also 
challenges, I think, with um, financial resources, that's something that many of us as small business owners, um, you know, and that's where you can really access um, family, friends, but also opportunities that may be out there for partnerships. Um, also adding services to what you're already doing. Maybe there's something else that you could add to round out your business. Or maybe there's something that you're already doing that you're not charging for or that you haven't really developed yet. So. Thank you for sharing that. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Aborio, his uh, connection it seems to have dropped. He is joining us from uh, Nigeria and he was actually the winner of the 2022 US Chamber USDAF Young Entrepreneurs Awards. So in thinking of him in the continent in Africa and how that's exploding with young entrepreneurs and innovators, have either of you thought about getting more in the global market? And Lisette, I'm smiling and looking at you in particular. <laughs> Yes, um, definitely. Um, actually, I do immigration law. And so I am actually the daughter of immigrants. My siblings are immigrants. And so I've always been very much exposed to foreign countries and travel. Travel is, uh, I don't want to rush to the end, but my most fun thing to do is to travel and learn about new cultures and languages. And so my law firm, I think the reason that I'm able to do so well in my firm is because I have such a diverse pool of clients. I mean, every they're from, you know, Dominican Republic, India, Russia, China, uh, the UK, Canada, and the list goes on and on. And it has really helped me to grow as an entrepreneur because there's a lot of um, cultural nuances and differences sometimes when you're you know dealing with different clients but also who i'm hiring within the us um having a diverse group and a diverse team that you work with has been invaluable in also growing into a global market and just finally i have a love for language and culture and people and so i kind of combine all my interests and i'm able to use that you know, in, in my business as well. And it has, it has really made a huge difference, understanding where your clients are coming from. Great, and Sean, before you answer, I just wanna remind our audience that we are taking live Q&A. Um, so please feel free to drop your questions in the chat if you have any for our wonderful panelists. Sean, what about you? Are you thinking about getting more involved in the global market? Um, I think I'm always thinking about business opportunities in general. Um, I haven't put too much thought in the global market. Um, both of my parents are also immigrants from South America. So I kind of have that, I guess, cultural background and um, been out the country and was able to study abroad in China for four months. So I've been to different countries and I've kind of seen some opportunities, but uh, I will say that not in this moment. I, I've been seriously um, diving deep and looking into that, but um, definitely um, an interest of mine for the future. And that's a great point of, you know, always thinking ahead, but really focusing on what you have on your current plate. Um, so, Sean, to put you on the spot a little bit, you were a 2019 Next Gen Scholar at the U.S. Chamber, which is a pretty awesome internship experience. How did that, if it did, prepare you for starting your own business and what you're doing today? Um, it gave me a lot of preparation for starting my own business. I think the main thing that helped me was being prepared uh, for any room that I walked into during that internship experience. Um, we went to a lot of meetings. We went, uh, met with different companies, uh, different things like that, a lot of fun activities. And what Rick and um, all the participants always told us was, you know, be ready for, um, be ready as you walk into these meetings, know who you're going to speak to, know who's in these rooms, know what you want to get out of these meetings. So just kind of always being prepared as you walk into any room. And I think that kind of also, um, goes along with interviewing and getting a job. 
a same similar process, similar um, train of thought where you should always be prepared, have questions and things like that. So uh, for me, that that experience was just great, just being exposed to different um, businesses, um, people, uh, even the other interns, they had other interests um, that they were all in. So I was more interested in technology, business, other people were interested in policies and going into um, uh, politics, things like that. So it was just fun to kind of collaborate and communicate um, with those people and also learn from them. So it was a, a fun experience. It's a shameless plug on me, but you know we love that program and we're thrilled that to have you as an alum. So I want to take a couple of the audience's questions. Our first one is, as a young entrepreneur, how can I build my network? It's hard to find a mentor. Lisa, you talked about finding a mentor. Can you talk about that experience with us? Yeah, I mean, it, it really happened just, um, I was an avid conference goer. I felt that going to conferences was a great way to network um, with individuals whom you have something in common with. And so oftentimes, obviously in conferences, there's panelists and you can really talk to them afterwards and see if you can develop a, a relationship with some of the panelists if they're in your local city. It could mean just going to lunch or going out for a cup of coffee. And you, it, it's very, I guess I would say, uh, old school in a way. Um, but I am a big believer in human interaction and using technology alongside, but also the importance of building relationships. So I think conferences are a great place to do that. And having a mentor, I actually still have a mentor whom I'm able to sit with. And we have the same background. He's a black immigration lawyer in Los Angeles. And he has been a great mentor to me, um, has really provided guidance when I have needed it. And so I'm a big, um, I, I think mentorship is really crucial and it's really important. And I think by networking, um, how? I think that physically going to spaces that pertain to your area of your, your industry is is key because you'll find individuals that are even willing to mentor there's also programs um where they can match someone with a mentor and vice versa so um definitely think it's a it's something that you should invest in if you're a young entrepreneur and finding someone that can guide you thank you that's great advice Sean, you know, uh, we've gotten a question that says, what are some of the challenges you have faced as a Black entrepreneur and how do you move through them? Do you have anything you'd like to share with our audience today? Um, I don't have much to offer um, to challenges I faced as a Black entrepreneur. I would say um, all entrepreneurs face challenges just in general. Um, I can't say that just being black, I face certain challenges um, in that regard, but just as an entrepreneur, just continuously um, trying to learn, um, continuously uh, investing in your business so, and also being patient. Uh, I think in business, it gets talked about a lot that you have to move fast. If you have an idea, you should act on it. You should be always be moving full speed with your business. But uh, I believe that sometimes um, it's necessary to be patient and take a step back because I feel that if you're truly passionate about your product or service or your business that, you know, it won't go away. So if you need to take a, a step back from your business, um, you'll still have that same enthusiasm and um, willingness to run your business as you did when you first started. Um, if you need to take a step back and then also uh, re readjust, realign, or, or re-strategize for your business. So I think that, um, you know, it's important to, to, to sometimes be patient as well as, you know, move, move forward with your ideas at the same time. Great. I, I would like to add to that. Can I? Please. Oh, so for me, 
Um, it definitely played a part being, you know, a black female entrepreneur um, because I actually practice an area of immigration law, which requires that you network and that you have individuals that can send you clients because it's employment based. And it was um, also I did visas for foreign investors, for companies. And so when I first moved out to L.A., I really did not know anyone at all. Uh, so I had to start building from scratch, basically. And not having a network in the beginning was really, really hard because you're not really going to get those type of clients. And so eventually by networking, like I would work, let's say, 10 hours and then go to a networking event and figure it out. And I would do that so consistently that people started getting to know me. And once you start getting your first client and you do a really great job, then other clients would, you know, follow. But it did take some, you know, really wonderful colleagues of mine to, to believe in me and to um, refer their clients to me. They were corporate partners of law firms, guys, you know, that really um, wanted to support me and and that was very helpful. So I do feel that the area that I specifically practice um, can be more challenging if you know if you don't have a real diverse network or support. I appreciate you sharing that insight. That's it's critically important. Each industry is so different and so it's it's important to, to take a step back and see where you're at. Um, it was shared with us earlier by Mr. Nicholas Perkins of Fuddruckers that he gets no time off, which I think is a very common phrase for entrepreneurs. So when you do have a moment of relaxation, what, what do you like to do, Lisette? <laughs> well, I like to do a lot. Um, the first thing I would say is I love connecting with friends and family. That's a lot of fun for me and just, you know, dinners, just a regular. But I love travel. I love dancing, um, exercise. I love to live life. I think that the more that I am able to dream and live and be passionate about my life, I'm able to also give that same amount of passion to what I do. So I think there were stages in the very beginning, though, that it was difficult to have fun outside of work. So we always made sure that since we were there long hours, that we maybe brought dinner for the team, that we brought a, a bottle of wine and shared it amongst ourselves while we worked late. So I think enjoyment, it doesn't have to be separate. I think that I have been able to integrate having fun into my work life. That's awesome. Sean, what about you? How do you, you know, de-stress and relax and have fun? Um, for me, I love to also exercise and, and play basketball. I've been playing basketball pretty much um, my whole life. Um, I got a new hobby, which is collecting records. So I got a record player and I like to collect classic albums. Um, one of the first albums I bought was um, Michael Jackson Thriller. So you can't go wrong with that. And then the last thing I'll say is um, I genuinely enjoy what I do, which is building websites and, and creating digital strategies. So building websites allows me to be creative. So it's I actually really enjoy um, that space to just be creative, generate ideas and, and create something, um, whether that's for a client or whether that's a, a personal project of mine. So that's what I enjoy doing. I love that. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Lisette. And thank you everyone for joining us today. The U.S. Chamber of Quality of Opportunity Initiative develops real sustainable solutions to help close race-based opportunity gaps. It's driven by data and informed by conversations. And through that, we're able to advance these solutions through private sector initiatives and policy advocacy. To learn more and to join us, please visit uschamber.com EOI. Thank you so much everyone for joining today.